Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Ask WHO session with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kirko about COVID-19. Uh, we'll talk about epidemiological situation at the moment, COVID variants, testing, contact tracing, and other things that we as well can contribute to to stop this virus from spreading further. If you're watching us on Twitter, as usual, you can ask questions by using the hashtag AskWHO. If you are on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, we'll monitor your questions through the comment section. Um, Mike, Maria, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today again to talk to our social media viewers and followers. <laughs> um, as, as usual, maybe we can start with where is the COVID-19 virus making the highest problem at the moment? What are the, the hotspots of the transmission? So, hey, Alex, um, great to be back with you again. Um, I think one of these days I'm going to be able to give you an answer, which basically just gives sort of one area of a hotspot. But unfortunately, we're still in we're still in the middle of this global pandemic. Um, we have seen some good trends in recent weeks. Uh, in the last two weeks, we have seen a decline in cases reported to WHO. Um, with last week about 3.6 million new cases reported. That's still an extremely high number, uh, 21 months into a global pandemic. Um, but there is a decline over the last two weeks or so. We've also seen a decline in deaths in the last four weeks. So over the last month, um, deaths have been declining, and that is also a good sign. But last week alone, 59,000 people died from COVID-19. Again, these are numbers we know are underestimates of the true numbers of cases and deaths. If we look regionally, you know, while at a global level we are seeing declines, there is some variation by region, um, as you hear us say uh, quite often. In all of the WHO regions except Africa, we've seen a decline in cases. Um, and in all of the regions except Europe and the Western Pacific, we've seen a decline in deaths. Um, there are, unfortunately, there are hot spots, you know, areas of really intense activities in all of WHO's regions. Um, far too many for me to even list. Um, and I think that's the challenge that we face right now. There are many factors that are driving transmission. They're the same five factors that we've been talking about over and over again. It's the virus variants um, that are more transmissible. It's increased social mobility. Uh, social mobility and social mixing. And this means that people are coming into contact with more individuals. And if you do that in the context of the inappropriate or the lack of use of, of simple measures like wearing a mask or physical distancing or improving ventilation, that's not so easy, but improving ventilation, avoiding crowded spaces. And if you do that in the context of a highly susceptible population because they don't have access to vaccine, and they're getting misinformation or disinformation, that's an incredibly dangerous position that we remain in. Um, one other thing just to mention is that we are seeing some really good information uh, in our regular analyses showing that the vaccines are inc incredibly robust against severe disease. So in the data where we have good data looking at hospitalizations and looking at those individuals who are in intensive care, um, that is happening uh, much more often amongst people who are unvaccinated. Um, so the vaccines are holding up very well, including against the Delta variant, against severe disease. And that means against um, developing disease to require hospitalization and against death. And so that's a really good sign. Our measures still work. Um, and so we need to keep adhering to them. But it's still a long answer, Alex, because, you know, it's still quite a complex dynamic situation uh, that we're seeing uh, around the world. Thank you very much, Maria. Dr. Mike Ryan, good afternoon. Do you have any any thoughts on the epidemiological situation as well to add? So I, I think it's, it's great to see that, you know, we see a, a progressive decline over the last couple of weeks in cases and and long may that continue and certainly getting below 60,000 deaths is is great but that as maria said that's still an awful lot of people um an awful lot of people uh, dying uh, in this response and uh, and it's a bit like a roller coaster i think if you look uh, and those of you who have a chance look at the epidemiologic curve you see them all the time it is the nearest thing to a roller coaster it just goes up and over up and over and up and over again and we're on the third downward trend 
but we've been on three downward trends before or four downward trends before and we've gone straight back up the hill so we need to be really careful not to over interpret as we've done before over interpret uh numbers of falling cases uh you know some of that can be attributed to you know seasonal impacts some of that can be attributed to uh, just uh, availability of diagnostic tests or sensitivity of surveillance so uh, i think we just have to be it's good news um but we need to interpret it um very carefully and and i, and I think another um maybe point to make is that there is a decoupling if you see in the in the, in the americas and europe what we've seen is uh, in a sense each wave overall has been lower than the previous wave but what we've seen in places like the eastern mediterranean and in the western pacific and in africa is that each wave has been larger than the previous wave in terms of the numbers of cases reported and more importantly in terms of the number of deaths reported and again what we're seeing is this decoupling um where countries with access to high rates of vaccination are at this point beginning to separate the number of cases the intensity of transmission is being in some senses uh, decoupled from the impact in terms of hospitalization and deaths and that's very often due to the availability of vaccines uh, in country and the level of coverage particularly in vulnerable populations and what it shows us is that vaccines work uh, vaccines work in reducing hospitalizations and severity and reducing deaths, especially in those people who are older or have underlying conditions. And what the data then sh continues to show us is that the numbers of cases and deaths in regions that don't have the same access to vaccines have progressively increased in each wave. So uh, I think we need to really reflect now on ensuring and tomorrow uh, Alex is the day that the UN General Assembly will there be a side meeting where President Biden of the United States will bring together global leaders to look at vaccine equity and other measures to stop this pandemic and prepare for the next. So it is a real moment of truth today. It's a real moment of truth. Um, we as a world are getting another chance, chances we haven't taken before to focus on vaccine equity, chances we haven't taken in the last two years to ensure that every vulnerable person on this planet, every older person on this planet, every healthcare worker on this planet gets two vaccines or one vaccine if that's the regime and is protected. Um, and the world's leaders are coming together tomorrow to speak on this. And I would say to you all out there, uh, I have one voice. Each and every one of you have a voice. Every single one of you use that voice today speak out on this matter we need to share vaccines equitably to save lives all over the world we can in many countries uh, in the industrialized north give third vaccines to vulnerable people and older persons uh, what people might call boosters and we can increase the levels of sharing of vaccine around the world we can do it all the vaccines exist the issue is are we willing to share them so i'm sorry to cut across an, an opening and introductory remark mm -hmm. alex but i think today is a very special day and this is a day for citizens mm -hmm. the the world's leaders are together in new york virtually and physically they're going to discuss this issue they're going to make commitments or not to fixing this problem and this problem needs to be fixed and it's not just a matter of equality it's not just a matter of solidarity it's a matter of getting out of the acute phase of this pandemic it's about stopping the emergence of variants. It's about so many different things. So uh, those of you out there who have a voice, please use that voice today. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and, and of course, Maria, to both of you, we are receiving already a lot of follow-up questions. And maybe, Mike, you can take this one from Ifat Hilal watching us on Facebook. He says, you're talking about decline in deaths, but there are still 50,000, and I think Marie actually said 59,000 people mm -hmm. died last week. Uh, so why with, aren't we taking a third dose, booster dose to prevent those deaths? So maybe you can explain as well why yeah. uh, WHO called for moratorium on booster doses. Yeah, well, I think the first thing to uh, say is the vast majority of those people who have died died without having been vaccinated That's right. uh, and again many of those because they didn't have access to a vaccine some uh, maybe because they were hesitant about taking a vaccine in some countries but mm, the 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 vast the majority of those people are people who never got a chance to be vaccinated uh, so in that sense uh, 
this is the reason why we're seeing the debts and, and still remain at these very high levels. And, I, and I'm not celebrating, to be honest, any figure like 59,000. What, what I was saying is those numbers are thankfully coming down. But as Maria said, they're still extremely high. And one, maybe you can speak to the, the issue on moratoriums on, on boosters. WWB, be, be very direct here. WHO is not against giving uh, third doses or booster doses to those individuals who will gain a significant health benefit from that. Older persons and persons with underlying conditions who already had a full course of vaccine, but who may benefit from having the extra protection afforded by that. What WHO is arguing is that booster doses in the general population who had wide access to vaccines who have already been vaccinated is not the best bet right now because number one we don't have the scientific evidence to underpin that and number two we know what will save lives you just said it 59,000 people died in the last week they died because the vast majority of them were not vaccinated and we're losing those people because they're not vaccinated and we can save more and more people if we shift the vaccines uh, around the world. And, it's, and, and in that sense, what the Director General has been saying again and again is let's focus on doing it all. But let's have a moratorium on widespread use of boosters in the general population in countries with existing high levels of vaccine. Let's focus on getting vaccines everywhere to save the lives we need to save. And then we can go back to the general concept of boosters later because boosters will come into the equation for older people and for younger people at some point in this process. As the virus evolves, the vaccines may need to change. There are all kinds of things that may happen in future. But right now, the best bet we can make to save life is to distribute those vaccines as quickly as we can to countries with low vaccination coverage and save those lives that we're losing every week. Thank you. Can I just, can I just reiterate that point? I'm sorry, I, I just want to reiterate that point. The majority, the vast majority of individuals who are infected right now, the vast majority of people who are hospitalized and the vast majority of people who are dying are those who are unvaccinated. Um, that needs to be reiterated. The vaccines work. The people who have access to those vaccines, it is saving their life. It's saving their lives. It's protecting themselves. It's protecting those around them. And what we've been fighting for, what the director general has been fighting for, what you just heard Mike speak about again, is that people need access to those. What we're saying is people around the world need access to the first and second doses before large proportions of some of the world's population get that third dose. If we had used the vaccines that have been distributed so far, the billions of doses of vaccines that had actually been administered to date differently, we would see a very different epidemiologic picture. We would see a very different picture in terms of the numbers of deaths that are occurring around the world that cannot be reiterated enough. And so all of us, that we, what we can do to fight for vaccine equity needs to be done because lives could be saved now. Um, you, we've all, I don't think the world has really yet mourned the loss of the millions of people who have died for COVID-19 yet. I think it will take many, many years for us to really comprehend this. Those of you who are watching who have lost loved ones, who have lost friends, know this firsthand. But I don't think we have even begun at a global level to really mourn the deaths that have been lost so far. But that doesn't mean that this needs to continue. We have tools right now. The vaccines are one. Vaccination is another to ensure not just the vaccines arrive in country, but those vaccines arrive in the arms of people who need them most. Those who are at most risk for developing severe disease and death, people over the age of 60, people with underlying conditions of any age, and our frontline workers as a priority, and then moving down. But those people need the vaccine first before third doses, booster doses, are received by people who are already well protected. That's what we're saying. And I know that this may be confusing to the general public because things change over time. But right now, I think WHO has been extremely clear on the role of boosters. And I think we will continue to say that. We can keep get asked over and over and over again, but you'll get the same answer because this is really critical because we can save lives now. We can also save lives by preventing infections. So I have to say it. It's not just vaccines and it only it's vaccines and and so if we could prevent infections, if we can reduce the spread, it has to be vaccines and it has to be reducing the spread because the more the virus circulates, the more variants will evolve, the more the virus will change. And we are constantly under threat 
of the virus changing enough so that our countermeasures don't work. Right now they work. The vaccines work. The public health and social measures work. The diagnostics work. The therapeutics are working. We need more therapeutics, but they're working. Um, but that may change. And we don't want to be in a situation where the virus changes enough that our countermeasures start to lose their efficacy. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, we are getting uh, quite a few questions about different variants of concern. Um, but Mike, we've, we've received quite a few questions as well on why mutations happen and what, uh, what is the factor that makes some of the variants so different to, to others? Um, I know it's been months ago when, when you were giving us a medical lecture on how viruses evolve and how they, they mutate, uh, but maybe it's the time to repeat this. Uh, but I think the highest interest for people is how the change happened like it is with the Delta variant that is more transmissible with the others. How wh What happens in that virus evolution to make such a distinguished change? Um, well, how long do you have? Um, uh, thanks, Alex. No, and maybe Maria can speak to the specific implications on that in terms of what we're dealing with right now. But essentially, you know, viruses are, are, are little packages of code, if you imagine it as code for those of you who live in the virtual and the IT world. And that code is is written in 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 in, uh, in nucleic acids and in, in RNA, and uh, the that the code that the virus has in its RNA basically allows it to instruct human cells to create itself again. Basically, it carries the instructions for its own reproduction, and when it enters the cell, uh, it's 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 able to instruct the cell to make more of me. Uh, and uh, and then send more of me to infect other cells and to infect other people. So, in that sense, viruses are strange. They cannot live on their own. There there are what they call their obligate uh, in, intracellular parasites. They can only survive and reproduce within the context of the animal, usually or the plant that they infect. So they're completely dependent on their target animal or target plant in order to be able to to um, survive and in that sense they have a very intimate relationship with those species uh, uh, and you'll see that over you'll see that with SARS-CoV viruses they they become very adapted particularly to bat species but just occasionally um, the those uh, those viruses just through the process of their own adaptation and evolution can develop uh, the ability to infect other cells in an intermediate animal or then in a human. And then that's where we get human outbreaks of these emerging diseases and where we can potentially spark pandemics. So in a sense, the viruses are constantly adapting and constantly evolving. Um, part of that process is very much random. Uh, these, When the viruses reproduce themselves, they make mistakes in the reproductive process. The, the code isn't perfectly converted into new code. Uh, and they don't have a an editing process to 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 sort of correct those mistakes. So whatever comes out the other end in terms of the code in the new virus is just slightly different uh, in the way that when humans reproduce, uh, uh, two humans produce a, a, a child that is not a perfect uh, copy of anybody and, and is a unique uh, entity. In that sense. Um, uh, viruses do the same just by uh, having editing issues and, and enabled uh, and in that the vast majority of those progeny or those uh, those uh, baby viruses uh, either are the same in terms of how they function or they're less functional and they're not very successful and just very occasionally one of those viruses with those mistakes just has an advantage it's able to get into a cell quicker. It's able to bind to human receptors more quickly. It's able to, to, to do what it does more efficiently. Um, and in that situation, the virus has what you would call an evolutionary advantage. It has an advantage over any previous virus. And what happens is that those viruses can then grow very quickly, expand very quickly, and effectively re replace the existing population of viruses. It's, it's the ultimate survival of the species at the at the at the micro level. Um, and in that sense, uh, the pressure on the virus, because uh, there's so many viruses infected with so many humans, for a given uh, virus to survive, it's got to 
show a competitive advantage. So there's pressure on the viruses, and that's what they call the evolutionary pressure. There's evolutionary pressure to be better than all the other little viruses, because if you're not, you're, not, you're going to get competed out of existence. And in that sense, there's a very definite pressure on the virus right now to evolve into forms that are usually more transmissible. The, in general, there's no particular pressure on the virus to evolve into something that's more lethal. It's not in the virus's interest, but randomly that can happen, that a virus can emerge that has developed some advantage in transmission, but just happens to also, unfortunately, have developed some advantage in terms of uh, its, uh, its lethality or its severity. And that's what we're always watching out for, a more transmissible virus that's more serious or more lethal. And that's what Maria's work with the Virus Evolution Working Group and with so many partners around the world is in tracking all of those different variants for, for those features of transmissibility, of lethality, uh, so that we can keep an eye. Um, as part of that process of developing um, sort of those mistakes that happen, the virus has a different code, and because it has a different code, the shape of the proteins it creates are slightly different, which can mean that our, we lose the effectiveness of our vaccines, or we lose the effectiveness of our diagnostics, or we lose the effectiveness of our therapeutics. And we saw that with the early monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the, the, the variants that emerged were able to escape the therapeutic effect of our antib we, antibodies. We were very lucky that the diagnostics and our vaccines have remained very much effective in this process. Uh, so therefore, you have this concept that the virus can, can escape the effect of our immune system or escape the effect of our vaccines. Um, and that's what we're always watching out for. So again, we're not just tracking variants, we're tracking how these variants um, operate with our diagnostics, with our therapeutics, and with our vaccines. And that takes a huge partnership around the world to keep tracking and monitoring that, the hundreds of thousands of different uh, viruses out there. So in a sense, this is a very natural process for viruses to go through, both in the natural world and their whole species, and when this virus has arrived in humans and it's adapted to us and what we call what we say in that is the virus has become fit it's become fit for 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 uh, human transmission i know in the in the in the younger community the word fit has a different meaning uh, but in that sense it's called fitness in other words what is the fitness of the virus and right now this virus uh, and the latest strains of this virus are highly adapted to transmit between humans very efficiently. And that uh, efficiency has increased over time. Uh, and that's why it's been so difficult with the Delta virus. It's just way more efficient than previous versions of the virus. Uh, but as I say, we're lucky in that the vaccines are holding up uh, really well, uh, especially in terms of how they prevent severe disease and how they prevent hospitalization and death. And our diagnostics are holding up very well. And we have new uh, therapeutics coming through uh, monoclonal antibodies that are effective against all the strains. So I think we're making progress. So that's the process, Alex. Sorry, I've probably over explained it all, but it's a fascinating natural process uh, in which viruses are constantly adapting to us, uh, constantly adapting to every single species. I mean, there are viruses that infect plants, infect animals, infect insects. In fact, uh, the viruses seem to be some of the most effective uh, little packages of biology on this planet. Um, and uh, we, we face the threat of viral uh, epidemics all the time in, in, in animals, in plants, and, and in humans. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this was very educational. Um, and uh, I hope it's clear for our, our viewers how those mutations and variants actually uh, evolve. Uh, Maria, we got a few questions on specific variants. One is about beta variant. Is it still the most dominant one in South Africa or Delta, Delta variant has overtaken? And there were questions as well about the new variant of, variant of interest. So maybe we, you can again list all the variants of concerns and interest that we are tracking. What do we know about them at the moment? and about their transmissibility and also circulation. Sure, I, I can give an overview, but I, I just listening to Mike give that um, overview of the viruses, that's actually why I got into epidemiology. As I was studying, I was looking at viruses and I, I was trying to understand why certain viruses evolve in some species, why some of them spill over into others, 
why they affect some and not others. And that's actually one of the reasons why I got into epidemiology when I was in high school. But um, I found that I find that quite fascinating. Um, so I'll take a lesson from Mike any day. Um, on the variants, so there are four variants of concern that WHO is tracking at a global level. It's the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. But if we look at the available sequences that have been shared globally, uh, and there are millions, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing how much sequencing has improved over the last two years. We still need more, um, but how much has improved and how much has been shared on platforms like GISAID. Um, the predominant virus that is circulating right now is the Delta variant. And in fact, less than 1% of the sequences that are available right now are alpha, uh, beta, and gamma. So less than 1% each of alpha, beta, and gamma are currently circulating. It's really predominantly Delta around the world. Um, this virus, as Mike has explained, has become more fit. It is more transmissible and it is outcompeting. It is replacing the other viruses that are circulating. So for example, if Delta uh, is, uh, is identified or start, starts to circulate in a country where there's beta, um, in South Africa, for example, it has quickly replaced um, the variant there. So Delta is predominant worldwide so far based on all of the available sequences that have been shared. Um, so of those four variants of concern, again, you know, Delta is the one that's by far the most transmissible. It's been reported in more than 185 countries to date. Um, and so uh, it, it's really quite interesting to see what is happening. Um, we have several variants of interest that we're also tracking. Um, the Lambda variant, um, you've heard before. Uh, the Lambda is a variant of interest. And as of the 21st of September, about 66,000 6, sequences, 6,600 sequences um, have been reported in GISAID. Um, what we do understand is that about 80% of those sequences have been identified in South America in particular Peru, Argentina, and Chile. It is hard for us to say right now if the proportion is increasing or decreasing because there is a delay in the amount of time when a sequence is, a sequence is available and it becomes available online. It's not a criticism, it just takes some time for us to track you know, what's happening almost in real time. So there's a few week delay in that. Um, but there are only 6,600 6, sequences of, of Lambda. The mu variant, um, there's about 6,000 sequences uh, that have been reported in 50 countries in GISAID. Um, again, about 30% of those are in South America. Um, mu seems to be predominant in Colombia, but in countries that have both mu and delta, delta outcompetes mu. And so these are the types of things we're looking at, not only the characteristics of the variants of interest, those, those mistakes in the genetic coding, those mutations that are identified, which may, you know, mean that the virus becomes e more easily transmitted, or there may be a slight reduction um, in some of our countermeasures. We also look how much is circulating. So right now, Lambda and Mu are variants of interest, um, but they don't seem to be um, dominant. Um, Delta is. Now, we will reclassify variants from time to time. Um, so there are, are three variants of interest that we are reclassifying um, as variants under monitoring. Um, and that will be announced tonight in our situation report, which comes out every Tuesday evening. Again, if you don't read that, please do read that every Tuesday evening, um, our time here. Um, but we're reclassifying ETA, we're reclassifying IOTA, and we're reclassifying Kappa. And this is really due to changes in circulation and that the, the variants of interest are, are just outcompeted by the variants of concern. They're just not taking hold. So again, there's a lot that's happening here. We're, we're working with partners around the world that are not only you know looking and, and identifying cases so that people can be cared for, but they're also doing sequencing amongst those cases to look to see what are the, what are the variants that are circulating. Um, it's a huge amount of work. You have to find the cases, you have to sequence some of those samples, those sequences need, need to be shared on platforms like GISAID and others. And then there's a large group of people around the world who are doing analysis based on the sequences that are available. What are we seeing? What are the trends? And there's a whole huge number of researchers that are actually doing studies to look at the mutations and to see why are these 
you know, interesting. Why are these potentially more dangerous? But so far, um, what we see right now, the Delta variant is dominant. Um, it is more transmissible, as you've heard us say before. And if you have a more transmissible virus in the context of, you know, a, a susceptible population without measures in place, the virus will thrive. And more cases mean more hospitalizations, more hospitalizations mean more burden on the healthcare system, and that can result in more people dying. So this is why it's all interconnected. It's why it's all related. But um, just a big thank you to our partners around the world, the member states who are doing the surveillance, the researchers who are conducting research and sharing with us in real time. And, and just quick, lastly, Alex, the general public may hear about some research that was done on the mu variant or the lambda variant or some variants that may not be classified as a variant of concern or variant of interest anymore because it's not circulating but that means that research is ongoing and so we not only look at those results of those studies we also look at how much of it is around the world and and so there's a, there's a combination of factors that uh, who uses to classify variants of concern and variants of interest at a global level. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, here is the follow-up question from Errol Kansek watching us on Facebook. If this virus continues to changes, is it going to be more mortal or milder? That's a great question. In general, yeah, yeah. viruses tend to adapt to their whole species and become milder. Um, they may become highly transmissible or more transmissible, but milder. Um, uh, that's generally the direction of travel because it's obviously not in the long-term interest of any virus to kill or hurt its host. Uh, so it wants to transmit, reproduce itself and do the least harm possible in a sense, if you imagine it. Uh, now it doesn't have a brain or a mind to do that, but that's obviously the best pathway for the virus's long-term survival. Uh, but as we've seen with many viruses like HIV, like Ebola, uh, and like SARS-CoV-2, that's not always the case. And you can't guarantee uh, that the next evolution of the virus will be automatically less severe, uh, especially if we put it under evolutionary pressures that might uh, select for more severe strain. So we, we need to be very careful how we deal with this. But um, I won't make predictions, but the general experience with viruses is that they tend to become less virulent, and that's the word for severity that we use in, in our game, um, uh, as, as they adapt uh, to the species in which then becomes a permanent host for the virus. It's one of those things that we learned in this that we, we don't want to predict because we <laughs> remain really humble to this. It's 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 still a new virus. I mean, I know we feel like we've been dealing it with it for for many many years, but um, you know we remain humble to this. You know we don't want to be surprised by this, so we follow um, the science on this. And this is why it's so important to keep this tracking up, and it's so important that there's the sharing of this almost in real time so that it could be evaluated each time there is this mutation and this, um, but we, uh, you know, we respect this virus very much uh, in the sense that we don't want to be caught off guard. So that's why we continue to remain vigilant and keep up the surveillance and why you hear us talk a lot about sort of building and surging these capacities for surveillance, for testing, for genomic sequencing, um, for making sure we have a workforce that's trained, um, that's protected, um, that can carry out the clinical care because it's not only important for this virus in the current pandemic we're in, it's going to be important for the next one as well. So we have to keep on our game and sort of raise the bar so that we are we are continuing to look. Um, no one over here or any of the partners that we are working with are sitting back and thinking, you know, we're going to ride this out. We're doing everything that we can to really reduce that transmission so that we reduce the opportunity for mutation. We reduce the opportunity for um, the virus for these variants to emerge. It's a pretty tall order, but um, you know, there's a lot of people that are fighting and, and everybody that's watching has a role to play in this too, because if you could prevent yourself from getting infected, and if you are infected to prevent the virus from spreading to others, you are actually having an active role in suppressing transmission. And, and really that's what we need from everybody around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that's a big issue because you know, people have said, to me, oh, well, you know, we have milder disease now and maybe it's there's more asymptomatic cases and I don't know if I'm a contact or not. And that's true. And many of us may be exposed and we don't know. And there's nothing you can do about that. You get vaccinated, protect yourself. 
you may become a contact of a case unknowingly. But for those of us who do become a contact of a case, and we a confirmed case, we can take so much out of the transmission chain by uh, taking the appropriate measures uh, in terms of uh, uh, self-quarantine. Uh, and I think that's the important issue. Countries that have been successful ha uh, have, have not said, oh yeah, well, we're just going to uh, quarantine all of those uh, contacts of confirmed cases uh, and that's going to end the pandemic. Of course not. But what that has done in many situations is taken the heat out of the pandemic, it's reduced transmission significantly and then allowed other measures to come in. It's allowed hospital systems to stay uh, upright. It's allowed vaccination to catch up uh, with, uh, with uh, more quickly. So I, I do think it's important that we continue to focus not just on vaccination, but on protecting ourselves from exposure as best we can, uh, making sure we get vaccinated and still uh, uh, taking appropriate measures to prevent ourselves from being exposed. Uh, and um, and if we are contacts of, of confirmed cases, that we still seek to self-quarantine. Um, um, having said, uh, you know, uh, that that a lot of measures are being lifted around the world, but uh, we, measures are being lifted in order to allow society to get back to some kind of normal activity. That doesn't mean we can throw everything out. We need to remain vigilant. And if you are the contact of a confirmed case, and we've said it here before, be the last person in the chain. And the best way to be the last person in the chain is stay home, quarantine, and you'll be sure to be the last person in the chain, if that's possible. So I know it's not possible for everyone who's exposed. Uh, it won't stop every chain of transmission? Absolutely. There are asymptomatic cases out there and there's unknown transmission, but uh, but we stop a proportion of it. And uh, where you can be, be the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, uh, and I think we need to continue that because as we've seen, even with high levels of vaccination in some countries, the numbers of cases have risen. Um, and that is going to find its way into the hospitalizations and deaths eventually. So um, high levels of vaccination, uh, that we need to continue with uh, testing, uh, we need to continue with surveillance, we need to continue with basic measures to quarantine contacts of confirmed cases if we can, uh, and we need to um, apply basic measures to protect ourselves and others while at the same time work and school and entertainment is opening up and that's great that we're seeing society opening up but we need to do it carefully we need to do it smartly and we need to protect ourselves and others as part of that process these are not incompatible objectives it is possible to open society and still maintain a level of vigilance and care for ourselves and care for others um, and keep our risks to an absolute minimum Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the importance of testing, contact tracing, quarantining, um, et cetera, because one of our viewers is actually asking about the rapid antigen tests. And maybe, uh, Maria, you can clarify when is uh, the right time or what is the right use of those tests? It's a fantastic question um, because uh, testing is absolutely critical as part of the response for COVID-19. And it's critical for every pathogen that we are dealing with, whether it's influenza, whether it's measles, whether it's cholera, whether it's, you know, Ebola, knowing who is infected helps us understand how we need to care for them first and foremost, but how we prevent the onward spread. Um, Antigen-based tests are rapid tests um, that are widely available now. There are many, many on the market. Um, and many of them are very high performing. Um, you need to choose one that is, you know, approved uh, to be used in your country through the regulators and have a high level of sensitivity and specificity. But these tests are easy to use. Um, they can be done by trained operators. And in some situations, they can be done by individuals um, following according to the instruction manual. Um, and they identify whether or not somebody is infected with the virus, acutely affected with, with the virus, and you get your result back within 15 to 30 minutes. So antigen-based tests are one of the game changers in this because the gold standard is the PCR-based testing, which often takes either hours to days to get results back, depending on where that's done. But the rapid tests performed by trained operators can be done outside of a medical facility, they can be done in community settings, they can be done by trained individuals according to, to national guidance, you know, in many different types of settings. They can be used to find, to do active case finding, you know, who is infected with this virus right now. Anyone 
who is a suspected case of COVID-19 can use a rapid antigen-based test. Um, we recommend the use of rapid antigen-based tests in outbreak investigations. If there's a cluster or there's a suspected cluster, you can use these type of tests and get quick results back to really understand how big is that cluster and what do you need to do to protect those and prevent the onward spread. We also recommend the use of antigen-based tests for screenings of high-risk populations like health workers, for example. Um, and so, you know, there's a number and other different populations that you want to sort of screen to see if they are infected. High risk populations are infected. Um, antigen based tests work best when people are most infectious. So this is right around the time they develop symptoms. So just before they develop symptoms, all the way through maybe eight or nine days of if you're mild, but it could be upwards of three weeks if you're of a, have a severe course of disease. And so there's a huge opportunity to use antigen-based tests. They're easy to use, they're cheaper, they're reliable. Um, and so there's a variety of ways in which they can be used. But testing has to be part of a comprehensive strategy. Not testing alone, you know, not vaccine alone, not masks alone, but testing linked to public health action really is what we need because that's what stops transmission going forward. That's what helps an individual know, what do I do? You know, am I infected or not? And if I am infected, how do I inform others so that they can keep themselves safe? What do I need to do? I need to isolate and I need to contact my medical provider to see what kind of care I need. It's all, again, it's all linked to these sort of chains of action. But what we were trying to do with testing is break the chains of transmission um, and make sure that people are well informed. So for me, I mean, the antigen-based tests are really are really game changers, but there there is a lot of snake oil out there. There's a lot of pretty poor um, performing tests. So make sure in the country that you live in, you look at the tests, you know, that are approved by, by your country, by the regulatory authorities. WHO has approved a number of them as well. Um, because this gives you sort of a standard of their, of their performance. Um, and make sure that if you're going to use something, you know, it performs as well as it says, it says on the box. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. We had, oh, please go ahead, Mike. Just add that people around there will have heard of these tests as lateral flow tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, essentially, it's a color-based indicator. You you put a, you you do you sample your nose. You mix it in a little liquid. You add the liquid to this little thing that looks like a pregnancy test. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you 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 put the liquid mixture into this little receptacle, and then you get a color change. And there's usually a a control which goes changes color and it shows you the test is working and then you wait 30 minutes to see if the other line lights mm -hmm. up and if the other line doesn't light up you're negative if the other line lights up uh, with the color then uh, you're at least a positive many most of the good antigen based tests are very good at saying negative if if, if the test is negative if the control changes color and the other one doesn't then you're very likely not to uh, have a detectable antigen. Uh, however, sometimes if you're positive, you can go in and have a PCR and the PCR might be negative. So uh, it's very important if you're positive on an antigen test that then you see yourself as a potentially positive case and then you have to go and, and, and engage with the authorities so that you can take the appropriate action. So if you're using those tests on a personal basis, uh, it's not just an academic exercise. If you're positive on an antigen test, you're very likely to have a, a COVID infection. And then there's a lot of things you have to do. Um, and uh, I'm, um, it, they're very, I mean, they're extremely useful. They've been very useful, as Maria said, with essential workers, like health workers. They've been useful in situations of essential industries like meat and other industries where they've been able to keep lots of workers working by doing daily testing, where you have really essential groups of workers that one case amongst a group of workers will put so many people in quarantine that they want to make absolutely sure. So each government can use these antigen tests for for various purposes, mm -hmm. both for surveillance and to keep essential services moving forward. Mm -hmm. Remembering that they're, while they're individually cheap, because they're used much more broadly, they can turn out to be quite expensive. Uh, and, and that's very important that the governments use these judiciously, but as widely as they possibly can mm -hmm. within the resources that they have. Uh, and WHO 
is working with other partners uh, around the world to increase access to both PCR diagnostics and antigen-based diagnostics. And we're working uh, closely with the Global Fund and others to try and increase through the, act, uh, the, the access to COVID tools to increase access for countries to antigen-based tests to use them more widely, but as Maria said, to use them more widely and more wisely so that we're using these precious tools uh, more intensively, but also using them for the, for the purposes for which they're intended. Uh, and that's important. And I think antigen-based testing will form a big part of the next phase of the pandemic control because it brings that testing into the community, it brings that testing into the home, it brings that testing into the workplace. Uh, and I think it can be extremely useful but not to the exclusion of PCR-based mm -hmm. testing and surveillance and all of the other things we need to do. And as Maria keeps saying, it's not, uh, it's not or, it's and all the time. So it's not antigen, it's not PCR testing or antigen testing, it's PCR testing and antigen testing, using both in the appropriate setting for the appropriate population. You get advantages from the, the availability and ease of use of antigen testing, uh, and for your ability, to, as Maria said, to take that to the community level, uh, it's a huge advantage. But, you know, you lose some of the precision of the PCR test. Uh, and, and it's finding a strategy that uses both of these fantastic innovations uh, in the best possible way. Uh, and governments need to be very proactive in deciding how they're going to use those uh, tests and how they're going to make them available uh, to their populations. But there's a huge place going forward for increasing and expanding testing in general for COVID-19. Alex, can I just quickly thank our civil society organizations as well? So we, we mentioned a bunch of partners, but I'd like to mention the civil society as well because they've also been extremely helpful in the delivery of, of some of these interventions and these tools and particularly on the testing side. And we worked very closely with them to try to roll out more of this done by trained operators, but again, outside of labs or outside of medical facilities to get it more into the communities to really help directly. So just a quick thanks uh, to them for the work that they do as well uh, in partnership with us. Thank you, Maria. I know we are running out of time, so maybe I'll take two more questions before we close. One is from Scarlett Cabs watching us on Facebook. Is there anything that can be done minus vaccination to scare away this pandemic? <laughs> yes. So do you want the short answer or the long answer, Alec? I but think that's an unfair uh, question. I think, you, I think you planned You did. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you may you make, Scarlett, I, I very much appreciate this question because it's it's really, really important. And, you know, we're not, I, I'm not at all trying to downplay the vaccines. The vaccines are amazing. I am astounded that we have so many safe and effective vaccines and so effective against you know hospitalizations and death but there are other tools that exist that that just prevent infections in the first place and it's at individual level measures it's the distancing it's masks but making sure that you wear a well fitted mask over your nose and mouth um, that you have clean hands when you put on and take off that mask your physical distancing improving ventilation in the buildings that we're in spending more time outdoors than indoors in the areas that you live teleworking you know, even companies and buildings and, and offices that have allowed people to telework reduce the congestion, you know, in the buildings where we work or in public transportation. And all of that um, limits the virus's ability to spread between people. And that's what our objective is right now. Right now, we, we don't want to give the virus an opportunity to spread. So if we distance, if we mask, if we avoid crowded spaces, if we open windows, if we improve ventilation in the buildings where we work, where we go to school, um, if we have good disinfection, if we clean our hands, if we get vaccinated, all of these measures are layers. Many of you have seen that Swiss cheese approach. We have all of these different layers of interventions. That's what WHO has been saying since the beginning, a comprehensive strategy you know, and all of government, all of society, comprehensive strategy, individual levels through communities, through businesses, through political leaders and financial sector and education sectors, all of that helps. So there is absolutely so much that we can do. And this is why it's vaccines and, and not vaccines only. The vaccines help against reducing severe disease and death, as well as 
early case detection, which allows people early clinical care. We have more therapeutics that are keeping people alive. We have more trained health workers who are better protected, who have experience with COVID-19. The earlier a case is detected, the earlier they get into that clinical care pathway, the better their chances are for survival. We have so many tests that are available, we just talked about, that help people know when and where the virus is spreading. And we have the individual level measures that can keep us all safe. So every single person on the planet has to keep up with these measures in terms of knowing your risk and lowering your risk every single day. Even if you are vaccinated, we are recommending keeping your distance. We're recommending continuing to wear that mask because we have these variants. And because while the, vi the, the virus you know, is still susceptible to these uh, uh, vaccines, incredibly so, that they still prevent against severe disease and death, including against the Delta variant, which is predominant worldwide. There's so much that we can do. So thank you, Scarlett, for asking that question, because it's so important that we remember that it's it's a multi-layer approach. But know your risk, where, you're, where you live, know what it is, and then take measures every day to reduce your opportunity to get infected and help your family. The last thing to mention is about information. Seek good information misinformation, disinformation, this whole infodemic that we are dealing with right now is hurting people and it is killing people because they are receiving bad information. And so this is something, if you have information, make sure you share good information, make sure that you go to good sources, talk with your family, um, you know, and, and address questions, you know, around because it is confusing. So lots that we can do. Thank you so much for answer, for asking that question, but you know, everybody has still has a role to play. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, and Mike, maybe the last question for you for closure. Uh, we've been talking about COVID and all the danger it still poses for, for us all. But I'm sure this is not the only concern that you and that WHO have. So maybe we can also remind uh, our viewers of other crises that we are dealing with or that other people are experiencing be besides COVID. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. I, 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 we are dealing with uh, so many emergencies uh, at the moment. I, I, we have, uh, I think, right now we're we're dealing with something like 63 different health emergencies, be they conflicts impacting on the health service and impacting on health, to malnutrition crises, to uh, meningitis, uh, yellow fever, measles, vaccine-derived uh, polio. Um, uh, chicken guia virus, Rift Valley fever, hepatitis E, and so many other things happening around the world. But there's one, and, and you, Dr. Tedros today is, as he always is leading from the front, uh, is uh, in Afghanistan and uh, has, has uh, done a visit there to, to, to really highlight the health risks to the people of Afghanistan right now. And, you know, we all stand in in, in in fear right now for, for the people of Afghanistan and, and, and particularly for women and girls um, in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of uh, access to education um, uh, and the, the huge um, uh, challenges faced there. Uh, there have been real gains made in Afghanistan over the last number of years in the health space. And Sahad Mandi, which is a, 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 a been a, a process led by Afghans working with WHO and UNICEF and other organizations to deliver primary health care and secondary health care to, to, to millions of people across Afghanistan through uh, an initiative to strengthen the whole health system and train uh, and, and deploy uh, many thousands of, 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 of health workers and uh, female health workers to a great extent as well, who've you know revolutionized access to child and, and reproductive health services and uh, certainly seeing rates of child and maternal mortality drop significantly in Afghanistan over the last number of years. Uh, we are now working desperately with UNICEF and with other partners with the World Bank to see how we can uh, support uh, the continuation of the, the, the priority health centers, the priority health facilities first and then all health facilities to continue to support the health uh, of the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and to make sure that all uh, Afghans, uh, especially women and girls, retain access to the health service and that the wonderful frontline uh, female health workers that, uh, that have been trained in Afghanistan continue to be able to serve 
uh, their own people um, in the coming months and years. So that's why Dr. Tedros is there. Um, we've been flying in supplies uh, there uh, and, and, and trying to, to, to shore up the, the system, but that's not the only crisis. We've just landed our largest ever delivery in, 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 in northern Ethiopia and Tigray in terms of supporting the, the, the essential medicines and essential surgical and medical kits for, for the people there. Um, and as I say, I could go around the whole world, all the way from Haiti to Myanmar to to uh, the Rohingya population uh, who are hosted in Bangladesh. There are so many uh, crises. And remember in this, this crisis in Yemen has not gone away. The crisis in Syria has not gone away. Um, we've seen even in countries as uh, with the levels of healthcare they had before, uh, like in Lebanon and the director general was there during the week and there are real threats to the health of the people of Lebanon. Uh, and that uh, Lebanon had one of the, the most sophisticated health systems in the world and it's now struggling uh, to be able to continue to deliver high quality healthcare. So it's not just epidemics, it's, it's conflict and political instability and vulnerability that leads to health systems going into crisis. So it's not just crisis caused by epidemics, it's crisis caused uh, by political crisis, by, by other things. Uh, one particular um, um, emerging issue for, for us over the last number of weeks and months has been the very worrying rise of, of cholera in West Africa. Uh, and, you know, we've seen huge increases in the number of cases and very often cholera is underreported. We've seen massive increases in the number of cases across a number of countries, uh, especially including, you know, Nigeria and Niger. Um, but other countries that haven't been affected for decades, uh, uh, beginning to see small but, you know, worrying incidents of, of cholera, which can explode at any time. Uh, Mali's had cases, hasn't had cases since 2013. I think Bikina Faso has reported its first cases in decades. And, and when we look at the Sahel and we look at that sort of those countries in the, 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 in the Sahel, as it's known in, 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 in West Central Africa, those countries are affected by a whole series of, of converging problems. Uh, We've got, uh, we've got uh, political instability and conflict. We've got, uh, we've got uh, failures in, in, in development and water and sanitation provision. We've got um, huge issues of climate stress, displacement because of climate stress, floods and droughts and sequences. Uh, so what we're seeing, and this is the perfect condition for a disease like cholera. This cholera just loves this, you know, poor water and sanitation. Poor, uh, a poorly coordinated response, climate stress where people are exposed to contaminated water, don't have access to proper sanitation, um, and, and cholera is exploiting that. And it's, it's, it's real concern to me that we've done well, and, and Africa has done well in dealing with cholera in the east and southern Africa. It was a real crisis a couple of years ago, but it's really concerning to see uh, this disease emerge in, in this context. We need to do more about it. But these slow burn emergencies they don't just start overnight and they explode and the world then reacts to it and says oh my god this is a big emergency this is the slow burning crisis this is the flood that rises slowly uh, and it still drowns you but it's just slowly rising and and we need uh, to me cholera um and, and, and it's interesting that we're still in a pandemic of cholera since the 1960s in a sense it's never ended but cholera to me is one disease that truly demonstrates the connection between health equity, social equity, and climate equity and climate justice, because cholera exploits social inequality. Cholera exploits a weak health system and weak prevention systems. And by God, does cholera exploit climate stress. And if there's any disease that unfortunately is a cheerleader for these three uh, interacting risks, it's, it's cholera. Uh, and again, we're facing that issue now, supporting the countries that are being affected but quite frankly it's very hard to generate the interest because understandably the world is 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 reacting to covid donors are exhausted we've got afghanistan and syria we've got yemen we've got tigray with so many crises around the world and yet there's this really slow burning crisis that will gain momentum um uh, and will continue to kill uh, unless we put in place the the measures to prevent it 
uh, and and uh, to treat cases. And again, in many situations, in, in if you go to places like Bangladesh where you've got really skilled cholera physicians and others, you can see case fatality rates of less than 0.5% in well-managed cholera. Um, oral cholera vaccination is very effective and has become more and more used in operations. We have a crisis right now in the availability of oral cholera vaccine for the, for the, for the task force on cholera control and for the ICG mechanism. So, so I, I'm again, I'm, I'm using this opportunity, Alex, I'm, I'm selling all my fish today, but uh, this is, uh, this is the real world. We're not just dealing with COVID where we're dealing with all kinds of diseases. Uh, and all kinds of crises within health systems that are generated by fragility, by conflict, by climate stress, by social inequity, by the lack of investment in health systems. Um, and, you know, most of those conditions are being generated and driven by human behavior, uh, by human investment or lack of human investment. So uh, I think we have, um, we have a lot of challenges, but also I think a lot of hope because I think we're beginning collectively at all levels, at the level of citizens, all the way to governments, we're beginning to recognize that we have to address these now. We have to address the issues of social inequity. We have to address the issues of health inequity. We have to issue, address the issues of climate justice. Because if we don't, we are just generating the conditions for future pandemics, for future events that will collapse our health systems. So I think uh, this is again, as we approach COP uh, in, in Glasgow, uh, we need to be able to show that there's a direct impact, climate-mediated effects on health, uh, and that can be through heat waves and through droughts and, and malnutrition, and that's happening, but also through diseases like cholera. So there's much to contemplate here, but also the fact that we have interventions, highly effective vaccines against cholera. We know how to prevent it. We know how to treat it. Uh, and yes, we don't have the resources. We don't have the commitment to do that properly. Um, and uh, I hope in the coming months, as we come through this pandemic, that we can reflect on what we're going to need to do globally to reduce the risk of epidemics and the impacts of epidemics in future, um, and all of the other risks to our health systems that exist because of poor governance, because of conflict, um, and because of lack of investment. Thank you, Mike. This was a great summary and reminder as well on uh, what are different um, viruses and infections that people are at risk of or suffering, suffering from, not only COVID. Um, I'd like to thank all our viewers for watching us today and for their questions. And I want to mention some because especially there are some from Afghanistan, um, India, Nepal, Germany, Ethiopia, Italy, Ghana, Nigeria, Brazil, Cambodia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UK, South Africa, uh, Togo, Liberia, Mali, and many others. So, and some of them you actually mentioned that are facing different crises. So I wanted to thank to those people in particular for being with us and watching us today. Um, once again, thanks to you, Mike and Maria for your time. And um, until next week, I'm inviting our followers to stay with us on our social media channels or website for more information and join us next Tuesday again. Thank you so much.